unlawful and inhumane or a way to successfully curb immigration. Thousands of asylum seekers are hoping for a better life in Britain, but a new plan could see them locked up thousands of miles away. I'm Ali Aslan, and today on The Newsmakers, we look at the UK's offshore asylum plan. Morocco, Moldova and Papua New Guinea all sound like exotic holiday destinations. But for people seeking asylum in Britain, there's a chance they could soon become prisons. Leaked reports show the Conservative Party wants to detain asylum seekers in offshore centres while their refugee applications are processed. It's a tough approach facing serious resistance. The opposition Labour Party has condemned the proposed measure as not only ridiculous but impractical. The Tories, however, think it could solve what they see as the country's refugee crisis. But, as Adam Platz reports, this controversial plan may not even be legal. A scene that is reminiscent of the Aegean Sea in 2015. But this is the English Channel. Refugees, desperate to make it to the UK, pay thousands of dollars to risk their lives in flimsy inflatable dinghies on the world's busiest shipping lane. The number of crossings has reached an all-time high. In September alone, more asylum seekers reached Britain's shores than in all of 2019. Over 7,000 so far this year in about 500 boats. They account for a small fraction of the total number of asylum applications, but they've prompted the UK to take a hard stance. Take the example of someone who enters our country illegally on a small boat, traveling through multiple safe EU countries, France, Italy, Spain, shopping around for where they can claim asylum, making that final and extremely dangerous channel crossing to the United Kingdom, while lining the pockets of despicable international criminal gangs. Our broken system is enabling this international criminal trade. Home Secretary Preeti Patel has asked the Navy to assist in maritime border patrols and appointed a former Royal Marine as the clandestine channel threat commander. And leaked documents reveal the government has considered a range of options to house asylum seekers at offshore locations. These include the South Atlantic British territories of St. Helena and the Ascensions, and countries such as Moldova, Morocco, and Papua New Guinea. Other proposals intended to discourage the crossings include converting oil rigs into detention centers and creating floating walls in the channel. Civil servants have dismissed most of the ideas, saying they were only brainstorming following requests from Downing Street and the Home Office. But conversion of disused ferries to accommodate asylum seekers is still being considered. Human rights lawyers have warned that some of the proposals could break UK and international laws. The UN and NGOs have criticized the plans with Amnesty International, calling them a dismal reflection upon Home Office ministers. And in reference to the use of the Ascension Islands, the Shadow Home Secretary seemed incredulous. This ludicrous idea is inhumane, completely impractical, and wildly expensive. So it seems entirely plausible this Tory government came up with it. But some say Prime Minister Johnson's administration is simply adopting a policy long employed by Australia, which British ministers have themselves criticized in the past. The number of asylum seekers is actually down significantly since a peak in 2002. So why is the government taking such a strong stand now? And does the UK's asylum system even need an overhaul? Adam Pletz, The Newsmakers. Well, joining me now from Newton Abbott in the UK is Anne Widdecombe. She's a former Conservative MP and former Brexit Party MEP. She also served as the UK's Shadow Home Secretary. Roger Casal is a former Labour MP and the Secretary General and CEO of New Europeans, a pro-EU campaign group. And Chengetai Mupara is a human rights lawyer specialising in immigration law. Welcome to you all. Roger, leaked papers show that Downing Street is considering offshore detention centers for asylum seekers. What do you make of the proposal? 
Well, it's a very good distraction from the real challenges and problems that we're facing uh, domestically. Uh, and I think that's why that has come out now. Uh, there may also be uh, soon a leadership uh, fight in the Conservative Party and people may be positioning. Uh, the plan is uh, ludicrous. It is uh, unworkable. It would be incredibly expensive and incompatible with our human rights obligations. They might as well suggest that we ask asylum seekers to go on to the International Space Station. It would be a wonderful uh, TV, a wonderful distraction, uh, but it wouldn't work. And it would be, uh, as I say, incompatible with our uh, international and human rights obligations. So I can only think that this is not meant seriously. It's a distraction from uh, the the real issues, and I'd be interested to know what Anne Whittacombe thinks uh, about what the true motivation behind it is. Uh, and uh, we are more than happy, to, of course, to hear from Anne. Impractical and nonsensical is what Roger calls the plan. And what's your take? Well, you've got to ask yourself why it is that people do go through so many safe countries if they're genuinely fleeing persecution, through so many safe countries before they arrive in Britain even though many of them don't speak English, haven't got any connections here. Why is it? The answer is because we're the easiest country in the world in which to disappear. And the message that the human traffickers send out is, if you get into Britain, you're very unlikely to be removed. Why not? We don't practice detention, certainly not routinely. We don't have national identity cards. We do have a flourishing underground economy. Now, if you want to reverse that message to deter the, the, the people traffickers and to deter people from making bogus asylum claims as opposed to the real ones, we want to reverse that message, which says that if you come to Britain with a genuine claim, you're most welcome. You always have been. If you come to Britain with a false or a flimsy claim, then you will be detained, you will be dealt with quickly, you will be sent back. That message is a deterrent. Now, that was mine when I was Shadow Home Secretary. That was my favourite policy. Oliver Letwin, who succeeded me, took it one stage further and said, well, it would be an even greater deterrent if we could house people offshore. Now, as far as I know, uh, the mechanics of that have never worked out. So I do support uh, all um, new asylum seekers being housed in secure reception centres, whether it's here or whether it's somewhere else. Uh, is actually a matter of very considerable practicality. And that's where I have some sympathy with those who say it's impractical. May well turn out to be, but there's no reason why we can't do it here. The government needs some sort of deterrent for asylum seekers, says Anne uh, Whittacombe. The message, of course, is clear. Even a successful crossing won't mean getting to stay in uh, the UK. Cheng Ata, you, you are a lawyer working on uh, this uh, issue in particular. Uh, aside from the political ramifications and personal leanings, uh, are the proposals on the part of Downing Street even legal? Um, uh, the, the proposal, I, I can uh, deal with the uh, issue of the legality of the proposals uh, a, a bit later on. But what I want to say at the outset is that the government is simply trying to solve a problem uh, that is not... Uh, as big as a problem as they say. If you look at the number of people who claim asylum in this country, 73% uh, of them end up being accepted. So this idea that our asylum uh, system is so broken that it needs a complete overhaul is a complete nonsense. Now, the situation there are problems within the asylum system. Um, First of all, those problems have nothing to do with the number of immigrants. They simply have to do with the efficiency of the Home Office. For example, um, if, I, if we put 100, uh, 100 asylum seekers in a line uh, and they claim asylum, 53% of them are going to be accepted by the Home Office straight away. When, for those that are refused, um, a further 20, uh, 20 are going to be accepted as re refugees by an independent immigration judge. So for a system with a 70% chance of success, I don't think this is, a, this is the problem. There are other problems within the system, but asylum is not one of them. Right. Uh, if I, if, uh, I'll, I'll come back to you in just a moment, Chengetai. But Roger, uh, the number of migrants to play devil's advocate making unofficial crossings from France in small boats is at an all-time high. And of course, they are receiving 
disproportionate and large media attention. Do you think the government here is under pressure to produce some sort of result and action? Uh, yes, they clearly are under pressure, and this is the uh, th this is a response that's guided by um, speaking to playing to the gallery and and uh, putting out a political message rather than uh, actually looking at the at the issue squarely in the face. As Chengatai has told us, seventy five percent of asylum claims are successful. So the idea that we're being overrun by people seeking asylum who are, are not entitled to it is um, not correct. Um, there has been an increase, as you've, as you've said, in channel crossings, and this is potentially linked to uh, Britain leaving the European Union, because under the Dublin regulation, we would be in a position to be able to return uh, people so that they do apply in the country where they first arrive, rather than come on to, to Britain. So we've created a, an issue for ourselves by leaving the European Union, and I think we'll see more of this. But the, the answer isn't to uh, pretend to stick our head in the sand or, 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 or try and stick the head of asylum seekers in, 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 in the sand somewhere else. It's to confront the real issues, and we need to be working uh, internationally and still working in partnership in some way with the European Union to manage these migration flows in a, in a sensible, humane way and in, in absolutely in compliance with our, our international obligations. And let's remember that the, 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 the United Kingdom is still a signatory to the European Convention on Human Rights, even though it's leaving the European Union. And the number of migrants making unofficial crossings from France in small boats is at an all-time high, but the number of asylum seekers is actually down significantly since 2002 in the UK. Why, why do you think the government is putting this topic on the public agenda now? Because it's, uh, certainly the boat crossings have highlighted the issue, but it's been an ongoing issue for a very long time. Typically, before the boat crossings began, uh, your uh, illegal immigrants, and that is what we're talking about, not genuine asylum seekers, your bogus uh, immigrants, uh, would come in on the backs of lorries and they wouldn't claim asylum. They would simply disappear. And when caught, would then say the magic words, I claim asylum, because we don't practice detention. Uh, there was no means of knowing where they were. By the time we came to say no, they disappeared. If they were by any chance caught again, they'd say, oh, well, they were going to appeal, which they then do on multiple grounds. I have been in the Home Office in charge of asylum. I know what goes on. Uh, and that was why, when I left the Home Office and became Shadow Home Secretary, I proposed universal detention, but I proposed it in this country, and that is still my preference. Cheng uh, offshore detention centers for asylum seekers, uh, sending them to Moldova, Morocco, or even Papua New Guinea. Speak about the legality of, uh, let's call it a brainstorming session on the part of Downing Street, because these are leaked papers at the end of the day. Um, the, the, the issue of offshore uh, processing of asylum claims, uh, as you said, it has been criticized by ministers um, uh, in relation to the way it is applied in Australia. Uh, secondly, in this country, uh, where asylum seekers or the, the, the asylum applications are being processed, where uh, the uh, claimants are in detention, there has been serious human rights abuses suffered by asylum seekers at the hands of um, the immigration authorities in the UK or the third, uh, the third party companies that are responsible for administering the immigration detentions. Now, when this is happening within the UK, there are measures uh, and mechanisms for assessing the rights of those persons. But imagine if this is happening in a country uh, like Papua New Guinea. There is no way of assessing whether people in these cases are being treated fairly. And remember, 73% of those who are claiming asylum eventually become accepted and become British citizens. Now, is this the way that we'd like to treat uh, future citizens of the country? I would say no. Uh, when you also consider uh, the issue that uh, Anne Whitcomb talked about, uh, uh, that uh, all asylum, uh, uh, all detainees, or uh, the asylum application should be considered when somebody's in detention. Remember, some of these people are running away from indefinite detentions in their own country. They have got mental health problems. And now you put them in a detention facility for a very long time. 
that doesn't uh, help the situation. It worsens their mental well-being and it perpetuates uh, uh, their, their incarceration. Somebody who is coming here to claim asylum is not a criminal. We have to get away from this idea that people who are coming to claim asylum are criminals. They are not. There are people who are suffering or not in some instances. Right. Uh, Anne, uh, by all accounts, uh, international, the international perception is that the UK government has not handled the pandemic uh, well. Um, and, and now it is once again entangled in a war of words with the European Union over Brexit. Do you think that these proposals about offshore detention centres are just a distraction, as Roger in a way has already suggested, a distraction from the shortcomings of current politics? No, I think they're long overdue. Uh, and as I say, I proposed them as long ago as 1995, for heaven's sake. Um, so, I mean, the idea that um, it, it, is, uh, it is something new and a distraction is wrong. But there were two points there. The first is that there have been human rights abuses uh, where this has been done before by other countries. Doesn't mean we will. Uh, and what's more, I would have expected any such centre to be open to, uh, to inspection. Uh, regular inspection. Uh, but also, <coughs> let me say this, saying that it's unfair to detain somebody because they may be fleeing detention in their own country. If I were fleeing real persecution, real fear, the prospect of prolonged detention, I would throw myself into the arms of the first safe country I came to. These people, a lot of them at any rate, have been through lots of safe countries, but for some reason, intent on Britain. Now, you do have to ask why. What is your answer? Um, if I can... And, and, uh, I no, no, let, let me... Sorry. No, Anne post the question. No, I, I thought... Sorry, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I thought I'd already given the answer earlier on, uh, yeah, but, but which it, is that the message that is given out to them is once you get into Britain, you're unlikely to be removed. I thought that was the answer that I'd given. Uh, Roger, Why do they come through so many safe countries if they're so desperate? Why? Yeah, Roger, what do you make of the argument that uh, these asylum seekers uh, are coming to Britain because it's convenient, because the UK is a nice place to live and a great place to, to, to blend in, if you will, as opposed to other European or non-European nations? I don't think there's any evidence of that, but it's an argument that Anne Whittacombe's been making very successfully and appeals to a certain constituency. Uh, I think it is a distraction. Uh, the issue of uh, people coming to claim asylum uh, in Britain uh, is not a new one. Uh, the numbers have been much higher in the past than they are now, so you have to ask yourself why, as this particular uh, chess, old chestnut, as uh, Anne Whittacombe uh, referred to it without using those words, being rolled out again now. I think the timing is to do with it being a distraction. But let me just say, I'm, I was pleased to hear that Anne said that uh, genuine, what she called genuine asylum seekers should be welcome in Britain. I was pleased to hear her uh, say that. I, I think we have some consensus there. I, I was disappointed to hear her use the phrase illegal migrants. I'm not sure what a, how a human being can be illegal. And I'm not sure how Anne knows that people have not, are not genuine and asylum seekers before their claims have been properly assessed. I think we have to calm this debate down. I think we have to recognise that uh, processing asylum claims is an administrative issue, and we need to do that quickly and, and, and properly, and, 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 and I was pleased to hear Anne say that that, that needs to be properly monitored. Uh, I think we need to get better at doing that. Um, but as Schenkerheide has said, the majority of cases, people who come here uh, are then sub are subsequently upheld, uh, and they can build their lives here. And I just say to Anne, if she wants asylum seekers to be um, process asylum claims to be uh, campaigned in, in other European countries, why is she so much in favour of leaving the European Union? Cheng Tai, I know you wanted to uh, respond to uh, Anne's, Anne's argument. Uh, yes, I, uh, the the. The, the main issue here about um, uh, this uh, uh, board crossings is that um, there are a small number of asylum seekers who try to come to the UK to claim asylum after having claimed asylum in several other countries or members of the EU. Since 2003, there's something that has already been referred to called the Dublin Convention, where mem member states of the EU have agreed uh, that 
when a migrant has arrived on their territory, their asylum application has to be considered in that territory. Now, if the asylum seeker has had an asylum application in Italy, Germany, France, or wherever, and that is unsuccessful, and they turn up in the UK, uh, 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 you know, by boat or whatever means, the the law is that the 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 country with the obligation to consider that asylum applicant's case is the first European country they went they were processed, and several thousands are re, re, the UK reject the applications, and several thousands of these applicants are returned to Europe to, for that for that as for those for their claims to be considered there. So that is a system that works um very well. Um, I, I don't know why the Home Secretary is bringing this up uh, as a uh, as a problem when we already have a mechanism of dealing with that kind of um, problem. The other issue I wanted to go back to is the so Home Secretary gave an example of um, an asylum seeker from Syria who has to wait 17 months for a decision. Now, that is not the problem of the asylum seeker. That is the problem of efficiency within the Home Office. The Home Office's timeline for deciding an asylum application is six months. Now, the only reason the average waiting time rises to 17 months is the Home Office refused genuinely, um, genuine cases. Right. So those cases have made their way through the appeal system and eventually um, settled after 17 months. If the Home Office improve their decision-making process, the waiting time wouldn't be that long. So this is not a problem that uh, the caused by the number of asylum so applicants. So it's more it's about... problem of inefficiency at the Home Office. Yeah, it's more about efficiency uh, in this particular case. Uh, Roger, in fairness, uh, uh, these were leaked papers, meaning these are, yet, uh, these are not yet officially formulated policies on the part uh, of uh, Downing Street. Do you think this uh, will see the light of the day? Do you think that these proposals have any chance of being materialized at the end of the day? I, I don't, because they are unworkable, and I think they were released to actually undermine um, the Home Secretary, Priti Patel, uh, to cast her in a, in a poor light, because they are, uh, they are ludicrous. And let's remember that a, a week ago, uh, Pope Francis, I mean, I'm not a Catholic, but Pope Francis made a very important uh, speech about refugees and said he saw the face of Jesus in every refugee. I think we should welcome refugees. I think at the time when we have COVID, when we have so many challenges to face, to sort of beat up on some of the people who are the most at risk and most vulnerable in our world uh, for the sake of domestic political point scoring uh, doesn't cast the UK in a very good light. And you've already voiced your support uh, for the proposals that are on the table, but how hopeful and optimistic are you that they will actually be turned into official policy? Well, I think if it was a question of using ferries, decommissioned ferries or something like that, uh, then it's perfectly possible, as it would be if we decided to detain on the mainland, um, on shore. Uh, but if they're trying to seek offshore locations, then I think they will have an uphill task. Um, I think it will be difficult. That doesn't mean I don't think it should be tried, that it shouldn't be pursued. But just let me say uh, two things. The first is uh, on the point of efficiency. If there were a proper deterrent to bogus asylum seekers, the Home Office would be much more efficient because it would have fewer to deal with, and most of them then uh, would probably be uh, the genuine ones. And secondly, to Roger, who said, you know, if you're an how can you be an illegal migrant? If you evade border control, that is an illegal act. R Roger, uh, your party has already... Uh... Out, out, called these proposals outlandish, impractical, uh, uh, inhumane. Um, but do you have any leverage at the end of the day as, uh, as the opposition to go about these and, and try to change these laws? Well, I, no, no legislative proposal has been put forward yet, and um, 
Uh, of course, the Conservatives have a, a, a majority in the House of uh, Commons. They've just passed a law which is threatening to break international law, so I'm sure they'd be able to pass this if they wanted to. But I think it would find a lot of resistance in, in the House of Lords. And what would be the point of putting something into law that isn't going to work, that's going to create more problems that, that it solves? Um, I don't think this is a serious proposal, and I hope they are not intending to bring it uh, forward. And as I say, as Chiang Kai told us, I mean, the way to uh, increase the efficiency is to increase the resources to the Home Office. And as for putting um, people uh, onto ferries at a time of COVID, that seems to me to be a recipe for disaster. Well, certainly a proposal that uh, will be interesting to see how this all plays out. And with a com, Roger Cassell and Cheng Etsai Mupara, thank you so much for joining this discussion, for giving your take on this issue. And thank you out there for watching, uh, everybody who has tuned in. Hope to see you again next time for a new edition of Newsmakers.